I'll begin my talk. We are in a right old mess. <laughs> my heart really does sometimes weep at the mess we are in and the seeming indifference of the world. I'm very aware that it's become very much a business as usual agenda post COVID. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we think otherwise. The ecological and environmental emergency is clearly the biggest priority that we have to respond to on this planet in the coming years. Having been involved since the late 90s, working as an environmental consultant, I've seen a gradual acceptance that we need to act and also seen the resistance from individuals, companies, policy makers and government to changing the way we do do things. Sometimes it's frustrating and sometimes just plain maddening. And I, but I'm sure we're all aware that there has been a shift in our lives. And uh, I just hope it's not too little too late. We know the environmental impact caused by mankind has a knock-on effect on social, political and equality issues. The effects being felt by all beings the world over. And we know that in order to mitigate climate change, we need to act now. As the pathway suggested by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, show that the steps we take now affect where we will be by the end of the century. In fact, we need to have acted yesterday, but unfortunately, that's too late. So now our actions will decide whether we will end up living on a sustainable planet with enough food and water and fuel to go around, with community living, a sustainable transport system, buildings powered by renewable energy, or will those that are yet to be born be subject to a post-apocalyptic fossil-fueled Mad Max film? Awareness of this environmental crisis has grown since the 70s. Ecology itself grew into a fully-fledged global movement with the development of nuclear weapons. Albert Einstein, who felt morally troubled by his contribution to the nuclear bomb, drafted an anti-nuclear manifesto in 1955 with the British philosopher Bertrand Russell, signed by 10 Nobel Prize winners. And this letter inspired the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the UK, which has become a model for modern non-violent civil disobedience. In 1958, the Quaker Committee for Nonviolent Action launched two boats, the Golden Rule and Phoenix, into US nuclear test sites, which of course is a direct inspiration for Greenpeace uh, about a decade later. Perhaps Rachel Carson's environmental book, Silent, Silent Springbow from 1962, was one of the most influential, documenting the effects caused by the use of pesticides, and in particular DDT. Why silent? Why silent spring? Because no birds or insects were left. Despite fierce opposition from the chemical companies, public opinion was swayed, which led to a nationwide ban on DDT and led to the creation of the US Environmental Protection Agency. So there is hope that public opinion will turn if the media, with all its influence, can get on side. So we need to be mindful how to bring the public on board too, so they're not alienated against what we are trying to do by disruptive climate actions. But to my title, what is the British response to this? What is my response? What is your response? These questions we will be exploring over the next few days. And I hope to start this conference with some of my perspectives. 
as Buddhists, we have multiple tools to use. We have the ability to master the mind, to master our emotions, to even become free of these endless sansaic cycles we are all in. But when it is applied to this mess, what then? There was, of course, no such crises at the time of the Buddha, probably because there were less than 150 million humans on the planet. Today, with over 10, our 10 most populated cities all have over 20 million people in, the world is clearly a very different place. Moreover, even at that time, the world view was primarily Brahmanic. Social systems were preordained and created by the divine, so they couldn't be questioned. This inevitably led to the caste system, the divinity of the kings, the subordination of the lower castes, and the horrific treatment of those outside the caste system. So radically diverting from this world view, the Buddha saw social structures as impermanent and contingent on human interaction, reflecting the laws of Pratitya Samapada, dependent arising. So the teachings are not directly speaking on this level, but the beauty of the Dharma is its flexibility and its applicability, the ability to be flexible to its conditions. Unlike other traditions, there is no Buddhist Bible, no stone set rites and rituals to follow. There is only the path to freedom. And even though during the Buddhist time, there were none of the environmental issues we are now facing, I think the Dharma offers us the answers we need. It is environmental in its very nature. Its principles based on loving kindness, on non-violence, on truth. It offers us a path of transformation for every individual and for the world community. It's the spiritual solution we need. I'm not saying, of course, we all need to convert, thank goodness, because that will never happen. However, anyone can practice meditation and ethics without calling oneself a Buddhist. The teachings of Buddhism, however we frame them, are what is important here. One of the key teachings of Buddhism is the interconnectedness and the interdependence of all beings. And this could equally be applied to the environmental crises. The illusion of a separate self causes us great unhappiness. Man is becoming more isolated and estranged from the natural world. And this leads us to act in ways detrimental for the welfare of all those on our planet. Buddhism seeks to shatter the illusion of a fixed independent self view, showing that we are all interconnected from the stars and the planets down to the smallest microscopic amoeba. When we see the world from a non-anthropocentric perspective, we can see that we need a holistic response to our problems. A Buddhist response would be permeated with a sense of liberation, the taste of freedom. At each step, it will connect us more deeply and richly with others and with the natural world. It offers us ways to have the courage to let go of old patterns, of old habits, and of ways of fixing ourselves. And this does not have to be a path of self-denial, but rather it can be seen as a journey, an adventure, an opening out into the very heart of life. Perhaps one of the most straightforward Buddhist teachings is where we can look for Buddhist response. I'm very much drawn to verse 183 of the Dharmapada, one of the most ancient texts. I'm sure this line is more familiar to us as a story, but I'm sure there's some scholars here that know the line I mean. So I'm going to tell it as a story. In ancient times in China, Indian monks 
used to travel from India to China to teach the Dharma. Once there was a very pious Chinese emperor who was always very eager to welcome great sages and teachers from India. And one day it so happened that one of the greatest of the Indian teachers turned up in the capital of China and the emperor, as soon as he heard the news, was very pleased indeed. He thought he'd have a wonderful philosophical discussion with this newly arrived teacher. Consequently then, the teacher was invited to the palace and received with all the ceremony and display you'd expect to see in a royal palace. Finally, when all the formalities were over, the teacher and the emperor took their seats together and the emperor delivered his question. He said, tell me, what is the fundamental teaching of the Buddha? So he sat back expecting a great discussion, a great discourse to occur with a profound insight into the inner mysteries of Buddhism. And the teacher simply said, cease to do evil, learn to do good, purify the mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. So the emperor was rather taken aback. He'd heard it all before, you see. In fact, we've all heard it all before. <laughs> so he said, is that it? Is this the fundamental teaching? So the teacher says, yes, that's it. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, purify the mind. As simple as that. But a child of three can understand that. And the teacher replied, yes, your majesty, that's true. Even a child of three can understand that. But even an old man of 80 cannot put it into practice. So taking this simple and clear teaching, this is how I'm going to look at a Buddhist response to the crisis. Cease to do evil, cultivate the good, purify the mind. Those that are familiar with Joanna Maestri's work, if you're not, there's the workshop I'm doing on Sunday morning, <laughs> um, you may have come across the three dimensions of the great turning. They are considered mutually reinforcing and equally necessary. That means they can be applied in any order and are equally required for what Joanna calls the great turning the shift from our industrial growth society to one that is life sustaining. So for convenience, I'm gonna to stick to the order of the simple teaching. So first, cease to do evil. So this is described by Joanna as holding actions. This dimension is to hold back and slow down damage being done by the current business as usual story. This includes the work done by environmental movements to gather evidence and document the damage being done, such as the work of Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. It of course includes campaigns, rallies, protests, and the work some of our friends are doing as part of XR. There are other ways we can act, divesting from the fossil fuel industry, sorry, divesting from fossil fuel industry, keeping pressure on our governments, both locally and nationally, all of course in a non-violent way. Some of this we will be looking at in more detail as part of this conference. Secondly, cultivate the good, or as described by Joanna's work, life-sustaining systems and practices. This dimension is a creative redesign of how we do things. For example, re-looking at our energy systems through renewable work, through renewable systems. And this work I'm involved in for the building industry. So my work often involves speaking to clients so they can see the possibilities available. I like to quote that in just one hour, the Earth's atmosphere 
receives enough sunlight to power the electricity needs of every human being on Earth for a year. Another area which I'm drawn to is donut economics. Perhaps in line with E.F. Schumacher's essay, Buddhist Economics, published in 1966, which very much goes against capitalist economics. He describes the keynote of Buddhist economics as simplicity and nonviolence. In April 2020, during the first wave of COVID-19, Amsterdam city government announced it would recover from the crisis and avoid future ones by embracing this theory of donut economics. This idea was taken from Kate Raworth's 2017 book. This theory argues that 20th century economic thinking is not equipped to deal with 21st century reality of a planet teetering on the edge of climate disaster. Instead of equating a growing GDP with a successful society, our goal, she argues, should be to fit all of human life into Rayworth calls the, split, the sweet spot between the social foundation where everyone has what they need to live a good life against the environmental ceiling. By and large, people in our rich countries are living above the environmental ceiling. Those in poorer countries often fall below the social foundation. And this space in between, that's the donut. So if you were to go out and buy groceries in Amsterdam, there's a new way of pricing. For example, courgettes cost a bit more now than normal, a little extra per kilo for their carbon footprint, for the toll the farming takes on the land, and to fairly pay workers. These are extra costs in our daily life that normally no one pays for or even aware of. Okay, we're going to turn to the third dimension, which perhaps is the most inherently Buddhist area, purifying the mind, or as Joanna says it, a shift in consciousness. So how do we transform the mind on a global scale? What can we do as Buddhists? Many of us are brought up under traditional Judeo-Christian Western traditions, myself, in fact, in the Jewish tradition. And one of the core commandments of Judaism is love your neighbour as yourself. It's from Leviticus. This commandment is one of the most central in the Torah, our holy book. It was always rather frustrating to be asked to do this, but with no real idea how to do it, especially if our neighbours can be so frustrating when they play music late at night. But Buddhism offers an explicit way to do this through the practice of metta bhavna, loving kindness. Sangha Achita's 1984 lecture, Buddhism, World Peace and Nuclear War, implores us, given the state of the emergency back then, to teach people to practice the metta bhavna. It's one of the fundamental principles of Buddhism that the individual is responsible for their own mental and emotional states. This means that we can change those states, providing we really want to do it and provided we know the right way to go about it. Sangha Achita suggests that to take up the practice of metta bhavna in sufficiently large numbers could result in the development of a more positive attitude towards other national communities, not only on the part of private citizens, but on the part of governments too. And this would undoubtedly contribute to the reduction of any tension, international tension, and thereby to the eventual abolition of nuclear weapons. Perhaps leading us to reach accord in our interactions with the world community. He further suggests that those of us who are Buddhists should give serious consideration 
to the possibility of our teaching the Metta Bhavna on a nationwide scale. That then was the nuclear crisis, but this is as equally or even more important now in our current times. We can certainly see ourselves that the practice of metta on an individual level helps us to respond to others with more kindness and consideration. And if we are to take it out in the world, we can affect others around us. This is the practice of our times. And through the practice of metta, we can develop the four immeasurables, the Brahma Viharas, vital to a Buddhist response to the crisis we are in. And these immeasurables can be developed in how we respond to the crisis and taking note of the near and far enemies can be valuable for us at this time. So through responding with metta to the crisis, we need to be aware of the near enemy selfish affection, concern for us, for me, for my family, for my community, even for my country. We need not think not as me, not as I, not as mine, but as us, a global community, interconnected and dependent upon a global transformation. We have seen this so clearly with the pandemic one country all but eliminates the virus. And then it again, it returns as a new variant, having grown undeterred in another country. Even more challenging, perhaps, is the far enemy to Meta, ill will. Can we hold that ill will when we other people aren't acting as we wish them to? When our friend tells us of a short holiday they're jetting off to and we get inside so frustrated especially as we haven't had a holiday for so long and we certainly wouldn't fly to get there i'm sure we've all experienced something of this perhaps being vegan perhaps trying to live a more simple life life while others continue business as usual but this is the real test can we empathize listen understand and respond skillfully for we will need to do this if we are going to have an effect. These are the people we need to get on side, acting locally, we are thinking globally. By responding to the suffering of the world, our hearts can respond with compassion or karuna, particularly to those in the global south, which suffer the effects of climate change the most. Yet here in the global north, we would need some four planet Earths to sustain our current lifestyles. So we need to be aware here of the near enemy of Karuna, pity. Can we really hear the cries of the world or do we cover it with avoidance, turning away or a consolation one-off donation to an emergency appeal? Tichnat Hand says, that what we most need to do to save the world is to hear within us the sound of the earth crying. How about mudita, the coming of metta together with someone's positive news? There is a lot of good news out there. There is progress. Many, many people are making a difference out there. Let's support these individuals because they so need our support. I understand now the fossil fuel companies and state-owned and multinational firms that have got interest in maintaining business as usual have realized they've lost the battle with smearing science. And the public are mostly now very much of the view that the climate crisis is man-made. And with over 97% of scientists reaching consensus. So what they're doing is turning their attention to smearing those individuals making a difference through media hate and conspiracy theories or showing that these individuals are not perfect, but are any of us. And lastly, how do we respond to the crisis moving from meta through compassion and mudita to finally upeksha, 
equanimity. Can we meet the cries of the world? Can we see the damage that is being done without being plagued with horrified anxiety or burning out, trying to do whatever we can? Can we respond as we need to respond, skillfully, with kindness and wisdom? Indifference is the near enemy of Upecha. I can certainly notice mental states that become indifferent. Sometimes it just seems too much. But that is our responsibility as Buddhists, to not look away, to turn to the dark areas, to turn to the shadows, for there we may even find the light. If we look deeply within ourselves, we can find the gift we have to bring forth to this climate crisis, uncovering our calling. We can all become eco sappers as we all have a role to play in the great turning. And we need to find it if our generation is the one to make that difference that I so firmly believe we can. This is the practice. This is our Buddhist practice for our current times. Whether we are acting on the level of holding actions, whether we're working in fields of offering an alternative to the status quo, or whether we're trying to transform our minds, ourselves, thus transforming the world, we all have a part to play. I believe we can find out if we do listen deeply to the cries of the world and find our calling. This, I feel, is the heart of the response needed to hear and respond, not through, not though in a traditional Buddhist, let's go off on retreat and lock ourselves away from the cries of the world, sending metta from afar, but to face them head on. This is what the world needs now. This is not the time to hide away, but to come into the world in whatever way we can. Of course, I'm not saying we should never go on retreat, or have time and space to recuperate, we just burn out. But what I am saying is, this is the time to engage. This is the time for strong communication. This is the time for skillful action. Probably the hardest part of acting as an eco server is the work or play that we do now may not even be felt in our lifetimes. Perhaps the trees that we plant will only shade the next generation. But as many Buddhist texts allude to, slowly, drop by drop, a bucket is filled. Perhaps as we all make our own mark, finding our own calling, whether it can be through stopping evil, cultivating the good, or transforming our minds, we can make a difference. Shanti Garba, in his excellent new book, talks of Shraddha, confidence. We need to act with confidence that we can each make a difference. I'm reminded of the story of the starfishes. A mother and a daughter are walking by the beach when they come across hundreds, maybe even thousands of starfish that have been washed up onto the seashore. So the young girl gently reaches down to pick up a starfish and gently walks to the sea and puts it back in the ocean. And then she moves to do this to the next one and the next one. But the mother says, look, there are so many. What difference will it make? As the daughter kindly puts another starfish into the ocean, she simply says, well, it makes a difference to that starfish. So let us find our gifts. Let us have confidence that we'll find it and that any actions we take will make a difference. For this is the teaching of Pratichya Samapada. This is the practice needed for our times. So let's continue our eco for work together with all our diversity and variety of skills and our faith in our practice through that simple teaching, ceasing to do evil 
cultivating the good and purifying the mind, we can face the mess we are in as a world sangha. Thank you.